Everyone's heard about the Great Wall Street crash. Black Tuesday, the most devastating stock market crash in US history, and that launched the beginning of the 10-year Great Depression, leading to scenes like this one, one of the famous photographs shortly after the crash. The sign says, if you can't read it, $100 will buy this car, must have cash, lost all on the stock market. Led to scenes like this. This is one of the famous bank runs that took place after the stock market crash. And led to scenes like this, where you have folks on the street with sandwich boards around their neck advertising the fact that they want a decent job. As you can see here, these are folks that we'd probably term middle class by today's uh, pronunciation of, of social classes that were out there just trying to find some kind of basic work. College trained, native Chicagoan, does purchasing, accounting, traffic, and then over here we have a cleric who was 44, worked for three years for Ford Company. That's how bad it was. So for three years after the crash, companies were firing an average of 20,000 employees every working day, every single week, for three years, right? So that's a huge, huge amount of people that were suddenly out of work. About 100,000 newly unemployed people for every week, every, every three, for three years straight. So every single week you had 100,000 new people entering into the unemployment market. So in some cities that translated to about 50% of the adult population being out of work, which is uh, almost impossible to imagine, even on the heels of our Great Recession relatively recently. This is a whole nother scale. And so of course it launched a number of uh, initiatives from the federal government under the leadership of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to try to help people out. And this is Roosevelt signing one of the first of the laws that would become collectively known as the New Deal. And the <coughs> New Deal focused on the three R's. Does anyone here know what the three R's are? I wonder if that's still part of our, our cultural memory. Anyone? Recovery is one. Yep, recovery, we got one. Any other guesses? Relief. Relief, nice. Two for three. Reform. Yes, well done. <laughs> so the three R's. Relief, recovery, and reform. Relief for the unemployed and the poor, recovery of the economy to normal levels, and reform of the financial system to uh, prevent a repeat of the depression again. So the New Deal, over a series of both congressional laws and executive orders issued by Roosevelt, hoped to address that. And the largest agency created by the federal government to address that problem was the WPA, or the Works Progress Administration, which is a hugely ambitious project that employed in the end millions of people, uh, mostly unskilled laborers to carry out public works projects, including the construction of uh, public buildings and roads. If you were traveling around America in the 30s, this sign in color there in the lower right would have been quite familiar to you. You'd see that at a lot of construction sites. So the WPA initially employed a large number of blue collar workers building roads and building bridges and public works projects. Every town, almost every town in America has some kind of WPA project, Mo many of them still standing today. Uh, right across the street from us, the library building, the original library building in town was a WPA funded construction project as well and now it's in use still by the library as, as our admin building where our management team has their offices. So, that was great for a lot of people, obviously, but there was a whole other class of folks termed white collar workers, and in particular artists and writers and musicians who also needed work and also were unemployed. And for writers, by 1935, about one fourth of the publishing industry was out of work. And the Writers Union got together along with a group called the Unemployed Writers Association to sort of push the federal government toward some kind of public works project that would create work for writers, as well as these folks who are out building roads and building bridges. And uh, six months later, the WPA announced it would employ qualified people in the fields of art, in the fields of music and drama and writing. And this was the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act of 1935. And that created a whole slate of Works Progress Administration progress, uh, projects, WPA projects, that were collectively dubbed Federal project number one, and that included the federal art project. You can see a poster in the middle there from the federal art project, and the federal music project. That's in the lower right there. They put on symphonies and concerts all over the U.S. The federal theaters project, which involves some big names like Orson Welles and Arthur Miller. 
and the Federal Writers Project, which we'll spend the rest of tonight uh, talking about. So of the $4.88 billion that was allocated in this 1935 Relief Appropriation Act, only 27 million of it went to fund all of these projects. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty small portion of the money that went into funding the WPA in general. We're talking about a, a kind of a minor portion of the budget. But never the, nevertheless, it created employment for a huge array of artists and writers and musicians in a time when they desperately needed it. So the Federal Writers Project was launched and this guy here was tapped to lead the project. This is Henry Alsberg. He was 57 years old at the time, a lifelong bachelor. He'd worked as a foreign correspondent and a playwright, and he looked the part of the distracted intellectual. <laughs> uh, he was always sort of fumbling for cigarettes. There's a cigarette actually in his left hand in the photo here. Uh, people at the time thought he was poorly dressed. By modern standards, I think he's probably a pretty sharp dresser. <laughs> but <laughs> at, at, at the time, people thought he was kind of, you know, this distracted, uh, messy-haired intellectual, right? And they sort of doubted his ability to lead a national relief project, um, but he was quite good at that job actually and he had he had very big ideas for the Federal Writers Project and he wanted the writers in particular to start documenting American regionalism which he thought was already in fast decline in the 30s. He, he thought that the richness of regional culture in America was disappearing and, and the onslaught of sort of a nationalized commercialized culture led by sort of corporate interests, right? So he wanted to document American regionalism before it faded from the scene entirely. And he hired on as his kind of second in command, the woman pictured there in the middle. That's Catherine Kellogg. And she came up with a, a brilliant idea. And she said, we should have state offices in every single state, and they should produce a guide to that state. And this is gonna become sort of the major output of the Federal Writers Project, which is called the American Guide Series. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we continue. But it was kind of a brilliant matching of minds in a way because Kellogg, the woman in the photograph here, wanted these guides to be functional as guides, as in they introduced you to the major cities and major towns in a given state. They talked about the routes between them, the things you could see along the way. But Henry Alsberg also wanted the guides to have in-depth essays on the history of the state, on its folklore, on its culture, on its, how, how it's sort of, um, how it's dealt over time with different ethnic groups, that kind of thing. So that, the, that regionalism that he was hoping to capture would be present as well in the, in the format of a guidebook. So half of the book would be these lengthy essays about the state's character and half would be these guides to actually, you know, that you could use while you're on the road and traveling along the state highways. And this is, by the way, before interstates, right? So interstates are still another 15, 20 years away and in the future. So this is, we're talking about the old highways that you take around the United States. So one of the reasons that we, Catherine Kellogg wanted to make something called the American Guide Series is because there actually were not any guidebooks to America at all, which is kind of shocking to think of in our modern era where anywhere you want to go now, there's a guidebook for it. Every state has its own guidebook and where there's major guidebook publishers like Lonely Planet and Frommers or Rick Steves if you go to Europe, that kind of thing. So the only guidebook to America in 1935 when the WPA was first getting going was this one, Baedeker's Guide to the United States from 1909 produced by uh, the European publishers who had created an entire series that I'm, some of you might have heard of Baedeckers before. They're extremely popular in, for people traveling to Europe in the late 19th century and very early part of the 20th century. And they, were, they had guides to every European country. And in 1893, they put out their first guide to America that went through a couple editions and the fourth edition came out in 1909, pictured here. Baedeckers United States, and that was it. So you had a, a European perspective on traveling in America, so there still had been nothing produced by American writers about America, and it was massively out of date. So that was one problem that the Federal Writers Project hoped to solve. So offices were set up, regional offices were set up in every state in the Union. At the time, that means 48. So there was 48 states. This is before Hawaii and before Alaska. And uh, the photograph here is of the North Dakota Writers Project office. Every state had its own director and that director went about hiring writers to work for that state's project. And they required their writers to take what they jokingly called the popper's oath. 
which they had to prove that they had no money and they had no property and no job and no prospect of getting any of those things. <laughs> And that was, that was called the pauper's oath. And on top of that, you also had to prove that you had some kind of ability to write. And, and preferably that in the past you were paid by somebody at some point to write something. <laughs> so once, once you checked those boxes, then it was, you're in, basically. And you're, and you're on, the, on the dole. <laughs> and you're making about $20 to $25 a week from the government. And, and then you're assigned a wide variety of projects related to the, initially to the compilation of these state guides, which we'll keep on sort of talking about as we, as we go forward. But by the end of the project, they'd produced well more than the 48 state guides to the states that were then in existence. There was 275 books produced by the Federal Writers Project, 700 pamphlets, and 340 of what they called issuances, which was just basically um, like articles or leaflets or radio scripts. So it had a pretty enormous output, well beyond the initial goals. We'll get more into that in a minute. But the crowning jewel of the Federal Writers Project was what became known as the American Guide Series. And here's a promotional stand for the American Guide Series. Um, several years later, this would have been in the early 40s when the whole series was finally completed. And the WPA writers produced volumes for all, all the states. So every state, all 48 states, got a volume. And they also expanded to include some territories. So Alaska did get a guide, even though it was a guide to the territory, right, rather than to the state. And Puerto Rico got a guide. Uh, Hawaii did not, which is kind of interesting. I think it kind of shows you at the time that it was an assumption that Puerto Rico would probably eventually become a state. And it still isn't. And meanwhile, Hawaii is. So anyway, just kind of a, a little aside. But then they also produced a number of regional guidebooks, things like uh, a guide to a particular city, like San Francisco has its own guide that was produced, Los Angeles has its own guide, New York City. And overall, when sort of the, the American Guide series was assessed later on, a critic in the New Republic called it the first attempt on a comprehensive scale to make the country itself worthily known to Americans, which is a, a fair assessment, I think, of it. Here's a photograph of the inside of one of the Federal Writers Project offices, and the photo I found here wasn't labeled as to which one, so I'm not sure where, where this was, but this is what the inner workings of the Federal Writers Project looked like. The, in total, the project would support 6,600 writers, which is a, a pretty significant across, across all 48 states. And uh, all projects were also supposed to operate, and this is sometimes less true in practice than in theory, but the all projects were supposed to operate without discrimination regarding race, creed, color, religion, or political affiliation. So now, we're going to actually go visit, through my slideshow anyway, some of the major writers that were involved in this project. We're going to kind of go on a state-by-state -state tour going through about five or six states and you'll learn about some of the personalities behind the guidebooks and we'll talk about some of the uh, scandal and drama that went on behind the scenes as well. So our first stop is Idaho. Does anyone know who this fellow is? I don't know if this is going to be a familiar face anymore. Jim, you can take a stab back there. <laughs> yep. Anyone ever heard of Artist Fisher anymore? Yeah? A couple of folks? Okay. So he used to be kind of a big deal. His, his, his uh, reputation's faded quite a bit now that we're in 2016. But Vardis Fisher was uh, strongly associated with Idaho. He was born in 1895 into a Mormon family, uh, very much on the, on the frontier at that time, born in a dirt shack, a dirt floor, dirt roof, one room, bunch of kids kind of a thing. But from youth, Vardis had been a loner and a bit of a rebel and a free thinker and a very ambitious and driven guy. And he'll bring all those qualities uh, shortly as you'll hear to the Idaho Writers Project. So he completed a PhD at the University of Chicago. He taught in New York City for a while and then he moved back west, first to Montana to a teaching gig that he only kind of casually engaged with and was eventually let go from. And then he retreated to Idaho to his, his original stomping grounds, and that's where he began working on his novels, none of which were at the time very successful. So he didn't make a whole lot of money. So when 1935 rolled around and Idaho was establishing its office for the Federal Writers Project, they tapped Fisher to lead the Idaho Writers Project. He was gonna be the main editor. And uh, he quipped that he was chosen because there were only three writers in Idaho, and he was the only one that was unemployed. <laughs> so I, I thought that was a pretty good line. <laughs> So Fisher applied his kind of amb uh, the ambition and drive he had toward uh, to writing to the Idaho Guide, 
and he was determined to make it the first published in the series because he wanted to get the press acclaim that would go with being the first volume in the American Guide series that was going to come out. And so he set a grueling schedule, mostly for himself, and it broke his, his first marriage as a result. Uh, but not to worry, he hooked up with a, a, a fellow researcher in the, in the Idaho Writers Project, and they were happily married for many years. But anyway, Vardis sort of took control of the project in a way that was going to be unprecedented amongst the other states. He decided this was going to basically be his book, and he, he couldn't really delegate tasks. He, he couldn't let go of the control. <laughs> And so he, he put himself on the road for basically two years, traveling every single highway and back road in Idaho, going across the whole state, and, event, and writing the entire tours section, as well as a lot of the major essays for what would become the Idaho entry in the, in the book. And uh, the book did become the first published in the series, and it uh, stands out in both format and structure then the rest of the books, as you'll kind of see as we move along, it's, it's bigger, it's organized differently, it's photographs are organized differently. There was a goal to kind of have all this stuff standardized, right? So that when you're looking at a shelf of the American Guide series, it looks kind of uniform in appearance. Um, so Vardis managed to get the Idaho Guide out first. And this is uh, from my personal collection. And I've got a few more tonight too. I'll just pass this around. That's the Idaho Guide. Vardis, so it's V-A-R-D-I-S. Thank you. Yep. In fact, as you can see, it's here on the screen. So, but before I talk, I'll, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit more about the politics behind the publication of, of the Idaho Guide. So, of course, the, the leader, Mr. Allsberg of the, of the Federal Writers Project, didn't, did not necessarily want the Idaho Guide to be the first one published. He hoped that the Washington, D.C. Guide would be the first one published, which, which makes sense, right? You know, that's the, the capital of the nation. So he set up a variety of kind of uh, onerous obstacles that Vardis had to overcome in order to get his book published first. But Vardis was a very tenacious fellow, and he did manage to get the Idaho Guide published a few months before the Washington, D.C. volume came out. So he, he did meet his goal. Then he ran off with his WPA researcher named Opal, and they built a one-room cabin as well in rural Idaho and, and happily lived out their days, uh, where he wrote novels that uh, sometimes people read and sometimes they didn't read. <laughs> and uh, that book's probably today his most famous novel. It's called... Uh, Mountain Man, and the reason it's famous is because of that screenshot in the upper right there. Does anyone recognize <laughs> that <laughs> fellow or that movie even? Jeremiah Johnson! Right. <laughs> so the film Jeremiah Johnson was, was based off of, of Artist Fisher's work, uh, Mountain Man. And uh, as, as Vardis went along in life, he kind of veered further and further to the right politically. And while he was uh, grateful for the work he got during the Depression, he became pretty sharply critical of the New Deal as it progressed and uh, uh, became quite a critic as well of President Roosevelt. So his own politics kind of shifted to the right after his involvement. That's yeah, that's all well, right. You stay in Idaho long enough. And <laughs> so Idaho's you know, Idaho's entry in the series was basically the result of one man's tenacity and ambition and drive. But the goal for this project was a lot more collaborative in its scope, and one of the offices that did an extraordinarily good job of that was in Chicago, in Illinois. Here are five of, and this is um, a self-selected five, because there are so many great writers that worked on the Federal Writers Project in Illinois, but here's five writers that all built a, quite a name for themselves in the 20th century, and let's see if anyone can guess who some of these folks are. So let's start in the upper left. Richard Wright? Yep, exactly. This fellow? Yep. Middle fellow? Yep, you got studs, that was right. How about this guy here? Nelson? Anyone got the last name? Nelson Algren? Yep, Nelson Algren. Woman in the lower right? No, but she'll come up later, great guess. Yep. Margaret Walker. Uh, uh, wrote a lot of poetry that people loved in a novel called Jubilee that was a huge bestseller for a while. And in the upper right, I don't know if you can make out his features, that's Saul Bellow. Aww. So you had a hell of a team <laughs> at the Chicago office for the Federal Writers Project. All of these people were in their 20s at the time. Uh, the racial lines were in liberally crossed, and everyone was working together to create a, a really awesome guidebook, which I'll start passing around too. This is the Illinois entry in the American Guide series, contributed to by all five of the folks 
pictured on the screen there. Richard Wright was 28 when he joined the Federal Writers Project. He wrote about life on the south side of Chicago, from its uh, tea rooms and its nightclubs to its bar rooms and sports halls. And then he also wrote the essay in the book on the history of black life in Chicago. That was largely penned by Richard Wright. Saul Bellow in the upper right there, who was 22 at the time, he wrote uh, biographies of writers, Midwestern writers that make it into the arts and culture section of the Illinois Guidebook. Studs Terkel went to work for the, surprisingly, for the radio division <laughs> and uh, researched and wrote about uh, famous artists and scientists for a weekly one-hour radio broadcast that was produced under the auspices of the Federal Writers Project. Then he would later use those skills, of course, to great effect when he, when he would collect his own oral histories later on in life. Nelson Algren in the middle there uh, worked as a field interviewer. So he went around sort of just talking to people all over Chicago, learning about their lives, and eventually worked his way up to being a supervisor and a main editor on the Illinois Project. So he sort of uh, corrected other people's entries and so on. And uh, Margaret Walker also was involved with sort of uh, the essays on black life in Chicago and on capturing what was going on in the south side of the city. And out of this, uh, um, literary meeting of minds. Uh, Margaret Walker and Richard Wright began a South Side literary circle, which became kind of a launching pad for a lot of black writer careers in the middle part of the 20th century, which is kind of cool as well. I noticed that these two books that you handed out were printed in their respective states. Was that part of the process as well? That they Usually, yeah. but not always, actually. You'll see some that aren't as well. But they that's, yeah. They don't have union labels in them, which is kind of surprising to me. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, I mean, in, in the general process for how this works is the guide is produced in, in state, but in theory and, in, and largely in practice is also supposed to be edited by the main editors off in Washington, D.C., which is where Mr. Allsberg and Mrs. Kellogg were, were located. But, um, and, that, and actually we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more later on too, so we'll come back to that. But that guide that's getting passed around right now came out in 1939. Um, it's, it's a great entry in the series. The chapter on Chicago alone takes up more than 100 pages and could be its own guidebook. And uh, there's an essay on Abraham Lincoln that was contributed to by the, uh, the governor of Illinois at the time, which is kind of a neat little historical aside. Henry Horner wrote the entry on, Amer on uh, Abraham Lincoln. And there's 26 tours of the state, which is kind of cool too, in the back as you kind of flip through it. And meanwhile, all those folks that contributed to that guidebook went on to produce the excellent array of literature on the screen before you. Uh, Black Boy, of course, Richard Wright's memoir. Jubilee was Margaret Walker's major bestseller. That came out in 1966. The Man with the Golden Arm was Nelson Elgren's major book. Hard Times, the Oral History of the Great Depression. Stud Tur Studs Terkel's collection of oral history interviews with folks that lived through the Depression. And Herzog by Saul Bellow which won the National Book Award for Fiction. So none too shabby from the Chicago office of the Federal Writers Project. No, good question. So the question was, were these funded by the WPA? No, these are just things that the writers went on to produce later in life, published in the traditional way by you know, folks like Doubleday or Random House and so on. But the, uh, the point really is just that the Federal Writers Project became kind of a, a fostering place for these writers in a hard time in their life. And then they were later, later able to produce uh, extraordinarily high quality literature. Okay, so now we're gonna travel over to New York City and meet a few of the folks involved there. I suspect no one in the room will guess who this is, but we'll try. <laughs> any, any takers on who the woman is on the left here? Okay, she... Immigrated from Russia in the late 19th century. She had a, uh, her most famous book was a collection of short stories that became a, a Hollywood movie in like the pre-20s. So she was in her, into her 50s by the time the project rolled around. It's not a name too many people are familiar with anymore, I but, Tilly sorry? Tilly no, good guess. I'll just say, so that's, that's, and I'm not sure even if I'm gonna pronounce this right, but Anzia Yazerska. Does that ring a bell for anyone here? Okay, well, you hear more about her in a minute. How about the fellow in the upper right? He might, he might be familiar to some folks. Any guesses? That's Ralph Ellison. Okay, and then in the lower right, how about him? That, might be, that also might be familiar to some folks here. John Cheever. <laughs> 
Yeah, you can kind of see. I tried to find a little bit younger picture of Cheever because uh, he was pretty young when he worked on the project. But we're going to start with a story about Anzia here because her story kind of mirrors uh, a lot of people's experience in, in, in a way. So she immigrated from Russia in the late 19th century with her family. They were fleeing, fleeing the pogroms and she grew up <coughs> in a tenement on the Lower East Side in New York City. She went to work at a very young age sewing buttons 12 hours a day and uh, saved money from that. She managed to set aside enough money over time to send herself to college. She went to the New York City Normal College, was determined to become a writer, and in 1915 she did that. She published her first short story. She kept on publishing short stories. And then in 1920, a collection of short stories she wrote about Jewish immigrants in the Lower East Side in New York, uh, entitled Hungry Hearts, that was the name of the collection, was released and it got Hollywood's attention. A film was produced called Hungry Hearts as well, and uh, Anna became sort of the talk, Anzia, I mean, became sort of the talk of Hollywood for a while. She was brought out there in a $100,000 contract, which is a huge amount of money in, in the late teens. And uh, she was writing screenplays and everyone loved her kind of uh, rags to riches success story. She was dubbed the sweatshop Cinderella. And uh, in the 1920s, she was sort of living the life of a best-selling novelist and screenwriter. And eventually, she grew tired of Hollywood. She moved back to New York, but she was very wealthy by that point in time. And she got a nice, huge apartment on Fifth Avenue, you know, one of the, the main streets in Manhattan. And then uh, over time, uh, as, as sort of Hollywood and the larger publishing industry lost, lost sort of their interest in this success story, this sweatshop Cinderella story, uh, she found it increasingly difficult to find a market for her writing and it had to, as a result, increasingly reduce her, her uh, living circumstances, living in smaller and smaller and dingier and dingier apartments until finally, by the time the WPA came around in the mid-30s, she was living in a single room with her daughter, desperate for money. And uh, she was excited when she heard about the New York City office for the Federal Writers Project, and she signed up right away, and was hired obviously right away based on that background. And she described the New York scene of the Federal Writers Project as this. We were as ill-sorted a crowd as on a subway express. There were spinster poet poetesses, pulp specialists, youngsters, veteran newspaper men, art for art's sakes literati, clerks and typists, people of all ages and all nationalities, all degrees of education tossed together in a strange fellowship of necessity which would be a good title in a way for this talk, A Strange Fellowship of Necessity, I like that. So she went to work in New York where she met these guys also employed on the project on the upper right there, that's Ralph Ellison who had been born out in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and who was named for his father's favorite writer, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, in kind of an unusual move at the time, his father used to go around town bragging that he was raising his son to be a poet. <laughs> which he did. His son became a poet and a, and a novelist. Uh, Ralph there got into the Tuskegee Institute in Al Alabama on a music scholarship. He was a really skilled trumpeter and he rode the rails to get there and he read voraciously the whole time he was in college and devoted himself to both literature and music but he eventually had to drop out. His father died when he was young and then his mother died while he was in, uh, in the Tuskegee Institute and so he had to head back to Oklahoma and to care for his younger brother and he did that by uh, foraging kind of interestingly by hunting and foraging in, in, in the hills and uh, eventually he found relatives that he could leave his younger brother with and return to New York City which he did. And so he went back, he went up to New York City in 1938. He was a, a part of the budding Harlem Renaissance. Even though he was sleeping at night on park benches in Harlem, he was always a snappy dresser. I kind of like the t-shirt he's wearing in that photograph there. He met uh, some key people like Langston Hughes and Richard Wright, who's coming up again in our story. After working for a couple years in Chicago, Richard Wright moved to New York City to become part of the sort of the, the, the lingering Harlem Renaissance, which was the big black writing scene going on in New York. And he joined up again with the Federal Writers Project in New York where he promptly hired Ralph Ellison, who was unemployed and, and desperately in need of cash. So Ellison joined the commies, he joined the Communist Party, he wrote a lot for Communist Party publications, and uh, then was embraced as well by the Writers' Project. And the connection between those two things, by the way, was not unnoticed by critics of the Federal Writers' Project. The whole time that this thing was in existence, as you can imagine, it was lambasted constantly by conservatives as being a communist plot to take over America, or as being an extremely inappropriate use of federal government money. We'll get a little bit more into that later on. 
So Ellison uh, was assigned to write about the history of African Americans in New York, which he did. And after the guidebook was released and the project continued for a couple of years, he uh, went about recording ethnographic studies and oral histories of black residents in Harlem and of the, of the stories of their lives. And he learned a lot from that experience and he mined the way that those folks spoke when he wrote his masterpiece, Invisible Man, which was published in 1952. So a lot of, a lot of that in a way stemmed from his experiences on the Writers Project. And then we have John Cheever from a very different background in the lower right there. <laughs> Some folks are nodding a lot, I think, if you know a little bit about Cheever. Um, Cheever was an unenthusiastic member of the Federal Writers Project. Uh, he was about 22 at the time. He'd uh, dropped out of college and he'd moved to New York from Boston, where he was hoping to make it as a writer. But he was a proud child of Massachusetts Republicans. And Republicans were um, hugely opposed, lar largely anyway, to the to the WPA and to the Federal Writers Project. And uh, the WPA was often uh, labeled by them, you know, so it's WPA, right, Works Progress Administration. They would call it the We Poke Along, kind of a joke about how slow the WPA moved, you know, it's, and that's what his parents called the WPA. So he was, he was ashamed that he couldn't make it as a professional writer and was forced to be employed by the federal government. <laughs> and so uh, he, he, was, he didn't ever talk a whole lot about his experiences in the New York office, but he did say that basically all he did was fix the sentences written by incredibly lazy bastards. <laughs> so, so he was an editor in New York and he didn't have much of an opinion of it. Um, but he did mine some of his own experiences for one of his early novels, in fact his first novel, The Wapshot Chronicle, which you'll see in a minute. With a New York City guide that came out, I'll pass that around too. Here's the New York City guide contributed to you by all three of them. Um, New York City one is kind of interesting. So there's a, a guide to New York State, which is its own entry. There's a guide to New York City, which is getting passed around. And then there was a third book that they produced called the New York Panorama, because New York has such a wide and fascinating and significant history that for the guidebook to the city, they split it into that part, which is largely about neighborhood by neighborhood, what cultures live in each neighborhood, how to navigate the different neighborhoods. And then this other book called The Panorama, which is all these photographs and sort of cultural histories about what made New York, New York. So it's kind of an interesting project over there <coughs> in New York. Okay, and then the three writers that we talked about, here's their, their major novels. So Anzia's book, Hungry Hearts there, that's the one that came out before, you know, before the WPA, before the Federal Writers Project, but it's still uh, in print today by Penguin Classics, in case anyone was ever curious about that. That's her collection of stories about Jewish immigrants on the Lower East Side. Invisible Man is you know, a classic. Uh, a lot of folks read that at some point in their uh, high school or college education. 1952, that came out. And The Wapshot Chronicle was the debut novel by John Cheever about an eccentric family in Massachusetts. And of course, John Cheever launched eventually a very uh, successful career and was able to leave behind the Federal Writers Project very happily for him. Okay, so I'm gonna take a quick drink of water and then we'll head south to Florida and uh, See if you can take a stab at who is who is here. Had someone guessed one of the people in, in, in these photographs already. Zora yep, Zora Neale Hurston there. A major, major contributor to the Florida entry in the American Guide series. And I don't know if anyone would necessarily know who the guy is in the upper right there, but I'll take guesses. Stetson Kennedy? Is that a name anyone knows? Okay, you'll hear a little bit more about him in a minute. So Stetson Kennedy was sort of the major editor for the, the Florida entry in the American Guide series. He was born in Florida. He was born in Jacksonville, Florida in 1916 into a middle class family. But he uh, had a taste for adventure and he dropped out of college and hitched hiked around for a while, eventually working his way all the way down to Key West, which was very much a Cuban town at the time and he loved it. He loved sort of the Cuban lifestyle. He fell in love with a Cuban girl. They got married. And uh, in 1937, at the young age of 21, he joined up with the Federal Writers Project in Florida and quickly became its main editor in that state. And he wrote, in terms of uh, his contributions to the guidebook, he wrote the uh, natural history essays that are, in fact, I can just start that pa getting passed around as well. So this is the Florida entry, the natural history section written by Stetson Kennedy. But Stetson's, uh, the, the stuff he did that's really interesting in his life is after the Federal Writers Project. So we'll get back to him in a minute and we'll go and visit Zora. Did, is there a question there? Yeah. So who could afford to buy these? Well, they were sold for like three or four dollars. So they weren't hugely expensive. And I think by the time 
so the whole series wasn't actually produced until the 1942. So the first one was 1937, and then you had them kind of in fits and bursts until 1942. And by that point in time, the economy was already shifting pretty strongly out of the Great Depression into the war economy, which is a whole other like, set of constraints in a way. But they, I haven't ever read about them being sort of considered unaffordable to the general public. They were priced at a relatively like, reasonable level per income. Okay. Right, so uh, Zora Neale Hurston, another native, I was just having this debate earlier, is it Floridian or Floridan when you are describing someone from Florida? Does anyone have a? Floridian. Floridian, okay. So Zora was a, a, a fellow native Floridian. She grew up near Orlando in a town called Eatonville, which was a predominantly black town with a black mayor who happened to be her father. And uh, after growing up in New Orlando there, she traveled around with a theatrical troupe for a while and then settled with her sister up in Baltimore. And she enrolled in classes at Morgan College and eventually kind of worked her way through a couple different colleges. She went to Howard University in DC and on to Columbia University in New York City where she studied with Franz Boas. And that's sort of the father of modern anthropology who came up a bit la in last month's discussions about the book Euphoria, but that's a whole other topic. So anyway, she became very interested in, in anthropology and in folklore and in collecting folk tales from people. And so after her education completed at Columbia, she came back down south and she went to Florida and she started going around uh, through all the different very diverse regions of Florida collecting Floridian folklore and recording its culture. And then she'd kind of balance that with trips back up to New York City where she also participated in that same Harlem Renaissance that was launching the careers of other folks we've talked about tonight, like Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison. And she published her novel, The Eyes Were Watching God in 1937, which is her major masterpiece, although it wasn't considered that at the time and would go on to be largely forgotten about for decades until Alice Walker rediscovered the book and kind of reintroduced uh, the modern American readership to Zola uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. But anyway, <coughs> so her novel came out. She wasn't making any money really from her books. And so she also joined up with the uh, Florida Writers Project in need of money. And she also had kind of similar sentiments to John Cheever of all people. She was a little bit embarrassed by having to go to work for the government. She didn't talk about it much. She tried to hide it from her friends and from her family for a little while. But she was based in her hometown of Eatonville, <coughs> Eatonville where she wrote about local life and local culture. And both Kennedy and Zola there contributed in very significant ways to that guide that's going around, to that Florida guide. And after the book was produced and there was still funding for the project in Florida, both Stetson Kennedy and Zora were continually employed by the project to collect oral histories and slave narratives from uh, surviving slaves that still lived at that time in the 30s in, uh, in Florida. And so she continued to contribute to the folklore division and uh, her, her contributions were significant. That's the guidebook there getting passed around. And one of the interesting things about that guidebook, which you'll see a bit as you look through the photos, is that it depicts a very different state than what we think of today when we think of Florida. You know, Florida has changed a huge amount in the last well, it's almost 80 years now, right? 70 to 80 years. And uh, back then, it was a very rural state and a very quiet state. And it hadn't really started marketing itself as a tourist destination or a retirement destination. So it was a very different, very much uh, more slow-paced version of Florida that you see in that, that guidebook. So there's a photograph of Zora's major novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And there's a major book produced by Stetson Kennedy called I Rode with the Ku Klux Klan. And this part's kind of interesting. So uh, Zora and Stetson worked really closely together. And Stetson had a very uh, uh, sort of liberal view for the time of, of uh, accepting all races and working together with all races and so on. So he hated the Ku Klux Klan, which was a big deal in the South in that era. And uh, he was in a way responsible for taking down the Ku Klux Klan, which is an enormously impressive achievement. And the way he did it is very interesting. So he, uh, he went to the local Florida chapters, the Ku Klux Klan, and demonstrated the things he needed to demonstrate to be recruited as a member. And so he was, he was brought in and he started learning all their secrets and he thought the whole thing was just beyond ridiculous. You know? and, and so he thought if, if the American people knew how ridiculous the, the Ku Klux Klan was in terms of its structure, it would cease to be such a scary entity. It'd be something people could almost laugh at. And by laughing at it, you could take away its power. And so he had a kind of brilliant idea, which was that 
Superman <coughs> was a big deal at the time on the radio serials, and he thought, you know, Superman's this hugely influential cultural figure. What if Superman took on the Ku Klux Klan? And so he pitched that as a radio series, and it was taken on. And in a, there was a 16-part series called Clan of the Fiery Cross, where they pit the Man of Steel against the men in the White Hoods. And uh, it was a, a brilliant idea, and it, it worked extremely well. Within uh, two weeks of the broadcast, Ku Klux Klan recruitment was down to almost zero. <laughs> which is, that? when was that? It was in 1947. And then by 1948, people were showing up to the rallies just to mock them. <laughs> and the whole thing became just this, this ridiculous, I mean, not that the Klan completely disappeared or anything, but in terms of its power and the, and the way it used to control politics in the South and so on, it was ex extremely diminished as a result of that. Um, so that was, that was Stetson Kennedy's sort of major contribution to American life. This is uh, one of the books he wrote about that experience I wrote with the Ku Klux Klan. And he kind of went on to become a, a Floridian man of letters, and he lived a long time. He only he only died a few years ago, actually, which is kind of uh, kind of nuts. He was in his late nineties. Yeah. I just heard a lecture um, where it talked about that art of the Nazi era, and it talked about Superman being um, revered by the Nazis. Yeah. About Superman being revered by the Nazis? Yeah, that he was like the epitome of power and whiteness. Oh, well. well Oh right. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other that's a whole other lecture, <laughs> and one I wouldn't be qualified to give actually. <laughs> yeah, right. It is interesting. So that's um, but anyway, that's the Florida entry. We're going to move out west now and get in California and Oregon before we wrap this up. And California. Okay. Anyone know these guys? No, but good guess. Nope, that's, so that's Kenneth Rexroth. Does anyone know that name anymore? Yeah, yeah, a poet, exactly. Uh, later involved with the Beat Generation. And, and uh, in fact, I say a City Lights bookstore uh, shirt in front here. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's Kenneth Rexroth. And then the other guy there is a more known in the field of music. That's Harry Parch. He's a, a very famous avant-garde composer. But you have to be into avant-garde music to know who he is. So you know, it's, I wasn't sure if anyone would catch that one. But uh, Kenneth had a very had a very interesting life. He <coughs> joined the Northern California office of the of the Writers Project, which is based in San Francisco. They also had a Southern California office based in Los Angeles, because California is, is a huge state, obviously. But Kenneth had been born back in 1905. He'd already led a fascinating life by the time he joined up with the Federal Writers Project. He was a poet and a, and a painter as well, an accomplished painter. He traveled all over the United States, all over Mexico and South America and Europe. He was a Buddhist and an anarchist and a pacifist. And uh, he loved spending time in nature and hiking in the high Sierras with his wife. And he wrote for the California entry in the American Guide series, he wrote the tour of Highway 99, which begins at the Oregon border and continues all the way south to Mexico, a route I'm, I'm sure some folks in this room have been on before. I'll pass along the California entry in the American Guide series here. And his contributions often read like the poetry he would become famous for. And that's really one of the pleasures of, of reading through the American Guide series today, is that every now and then, someone's writing just sort of sings on the page in a way that guidebooks usually don't, right? Because you have these enormously talented people working on it. So his descriptions of, of, uh, of Mount Shasta area are, are quite lovely in that book and uh, worth, worth checking out. So meanwhile, the guy and that's the picture there. Actually, let me keep it on this slide for the moment because we'll, we're going to talk for a second about Harry Parch, who is the fellow on the upper right, the son of missionaries to China. He grew up in Arizona. He realized very early in life that he was gay, and uh, he became primarily known as a musician and would eventually become a highly regarded avant-garde composer. But he spent much of the 30s traveling around the country on freight trains, hanging out with the hobos, and he really liked hobos. He, he said about hobos, in little ways there was a tremendous amount of creativity in their everyday living. Hobos are extraordinarily individualistic people. That's why they're hobos, which I kind of like that quote. <laughs> so even though, um, he was primarily known as a talented musician when he uh, kind of hitchhiked his way around the country and, and showed up first in Arizona. He was hired by the Arizona Writers Project to write for their tours section. 
because he's just this kind of interesting, really talented guy, and so they, they kind of gave him a chance. And he wrote for Arizona for a year, and then he got restless, he went further west, went up to California, to San Francisco, where he got hired on by the San Francisco office, and uh, became one of only four writers that are actually credited on the editorial staff for the California Writers Project. And he only stayed at the job for nine months, but he had a pretty big impact and the national editors out in Washington, D.C. Um, were commenting on how, how great his work was and hoping that he would stick around, but he didn't. He left and would go on to do some interesting things. So here's a, some photographs of a couple of these guys. This is contributions to later cultural life in America. The book there on the left is some essays from Kenneth Rexroth, but of course he's mostly known as a, as a poet, and he would become quite famous in the 50s when he emceed the Sixth Gallery reading where Allen Ginsberg first recited Howell. And he became known in a way as sort of one of the fathers of the Beats generation. And uh, that photograph there in the lower right is in front of City Lights Bookstore. And again, there's a shirt in front, how appropriate today, from City Lights Bookstore. Still in operation today. Famous gathering spot for the beat generation, of course. Jack Kerouac, Neil Cassidy, and so on. Allen Ginsberg. Meanwhile, uh, Harry Parch went on to build crazy instruments, like the one there in the upper right, which is called the, uh, no, I'll try to not butcher this, the Quadrangularis Reversum which he invented in 1965, one of many instruments he invented, uh, which, which um, he would then use to compose these very strange and, or interesting, depending on your viewpoint, avant-garde pieces. So again, uh, the California Project fostered its share of, of creativity. And then we'll talk a little bit about Oregon. Uh, Oregon, unfortunately, doesn't have any sort of great personality associated with it or any great story associated with it. So I just bring it up so that you know who was behind it at least a little bit. So the guy pictured there on the left, that's Emerson J. Griffith. And I'm not going to even ask anyone here to try to guess who these folks are. But Emerson Griffith was appointed the head of the entire WPA in Oregon. So the Federal Writers Project was just one of many divisions of the WPA he supervised in our state. And he hired the guy that's signing a book on the left in that upper right photograph. That's Alfred Powers, who was an Oregonian author as well as the dean of the University of Oregon Extension Department. So he grabbed this Powers guy and had him head the Federal Writers Project here in Oregon, based um, in Portland. And the number of writers employed here in Oregon varied between about 20 and 54 at any given time. And um, our fellow here, Griffith, took a pretty keen interest in the Oregon Guide uh, in the, uh, the Oregon Entry in the American Guide series, because he himself had a background in journalism and writing, so he was pretty involved in the editorial process for the Oregon Entry. And that was the main thing they produced, was the Oregon Entry in the American Guide series, which is a 500-page book. It has a thorough treatment of Oregon history and natural environment and cultural heritage. There's a lot of, as is usual, a lot of photographs and maps. And cities and towns are given descriptive essays, and there's a variety of driving tours. So that's the Oregon entry I'll pass around now, published in 1940. And then shortly after the book was published, the Oregon Writers Project shifted its, its uh, efforts to producing radio scripts and press releases for the military. So the main sort of thing produced by the Oregon Writers Project is that book there. And now we're going to go to Oklahoma and the last state we'll visit in our little introduction today. Anybody recognize these, these guys on the screen? <laughs> Appropriate guess. Okay, so you'll know who the guy is on the left, but I'm not going to tell you who it is yet because it, it, it cuts into an important part of my story. But the guy on the right we'll start talking about first. So that's, that's Jim Thompson. Does that name ring a bell? Jim what? Jim Thompson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yep, exactly. Yep, famous noir writer. Born in Oklahoma in 1914, bounced around the state as a young man working as an oil hand and as a booze and women runner for CD hotels. So that's how he made a living for a while, um, which is a great training, by the way, if you want to become a pulp or noir novelist later in life. So, um, he, and he would. He would later become a major crime novelist. He began at a young age writing for the pulp, so he wrote for things like Master Detective and True Detective and so on. Um, but he was, uh, pulps don't pay well, they've never paid well, and so he was struggling at the edge of poverty in the mid-30s when the Federal Writers Project came around. And so he took a job with the Oklahoma Division. 
and he wrote for the tours section, and he eventually worked his way up to becoming the main editor for the Oklahoma Guide, which is a pretty, pretty good achievement. But he never lost his fascination and interest in the darker parts of life and human behavior. Uh, and he, uh, he starts his, his folklore section in the book with an account that starts this way. An Oklahoman who ran amok on a visit to town in the course of a few minutes killed a representative of each of the five races. And he tells the story about this Oklahoman that killed all these people. That's, that's his start, right, to the folklore section, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> and, and he went on to, like, the, the kind of pulpy writing and the, the kind of vivid pulpiness of his writing came out in some of his descriptions. There's one where he, he describes Oklahoma City as a, a big town built on the ideas of a small man. You know, that's, that's, like, that's right out of a noir book, I think. And he said, it's, its cultural life is wrapped in the rusty hide of a lean and long dead steer. You know, I love that. And that's the kind of like writing that, you, that, that you know, jumps out to me in the American Guide series and what I really like about um, reading and collecting this, these books. So, um, but anyway, after his experience in Oklahoma, he would go on to write a variety of, of major crime novels, probably the most famous of which is The Killer Inside Me, which uh, was turned into a film a couple times, most recently just a, a couple years back with Casey Affleck in it. Uh, but the book came out in 1952. And so, well, Jim Thompson was working for the Federal Writers Project while he was working as the editor for the Oklahoma Guide. Uh, he had the opportunity to hire a variety of different people. And one of the guys he hired was this sort of cocky, arrogant fellow on the left here who was constantly boasting about how great of a writer he was and how great of a traveler he was. He'd, according to his own accounts, he'd been everywhere, he'd done everything already. That man happens to be Louis L'Amour. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, so Louis L'Amour, this is the, the product produced, the Oklahoma Guide to the Sooner State, but Louis L'Amour, whose westerns, of course, became the best-selling westerns of all time, was a, a young lad that got employed by Jim Thompson on the Oklahoma Federal Writers Project, and he contributed, although we're not sure anymore what exactly, but he contributed to the Oklahoma Guide. And unfortunately, that's one I don't have in my own collection yet, anyway. I'm nearing the end of my collection, but I haven't gotten the Oklahoma Guide yet, so I can't pass that one around. But the picture on the right there is The Killer Inside Me, the most famous novel, arguably, uh, produced by, by Jim Thompson, 1952, with an appropriate pulpy uh, cover there. And so. That was Oklahoma. Okay, so Oklahoma also was the last of the books to be published in the American Guide series. So we started with Idaho. Every other state published this book and Oklahoma ended that whole project. So when the Oklahoma's entry came out, the nation uh, celebrated with what they called the American Guide Week in the fall of 1941. That's a publicity poster for the American Guide Week. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, at at this time of crisis, when every student needs to know what America is and what it stands for, educators everywhere should be aware of the invaluable contribution made by the American Guide series. And they kind of kicked off this week of celebration. Uh, privately, FDR said that some of it is good, some of it's not so good, but all of it is native, human, eager, and alive. Native, human, eager, and alive, which I think is a good uh, summary quote. But of course, what's going to happen later on in 1941? <laughs> Yes, right, so we're months away now from Pearl Harbor and the, and the start of America's involvement in World War II. So, after the American Guide series was produced, however, the funding continued for a little while into the war years, not very long, but after the, that major output of the American Guide series, they transitioned to trying to gather volumes of American folklore, and the guy pictured here is John Lomax, and he was hired as the director of folklore. John Lomax might be a name familiar to some folks here. His, his son, Alan Lomax, might be even more familiar to some folks here. But uh, by the time he was hired, he was already a legendary ballet collector, a native Texan, a boisterous fellow, um, but uh, very much at ease with people, able to bring out stories very well. And so he served as, as the advisor for the national effort to collect folklore, and the major output from that was a collection of slave narratives, which you'll see in a minute. But <clears throat> um, after Lomax had to leave the project eventually to pursue other interests, the guy pictured in the lower right named Benjamin Botkin <laughs> took over as the folklore editor for the series. And they had interviewers that went around the whole country interviewing people about their lives. And the, including, for example, Zora Neale Hurston and Stetson Kennedy in Florida, who were employed by this division of the project as well. And the major book that came out of that is called Lay My Burden Down, which is a, a curated collection of, of uh, slave stories. The f f person on the right there 
was a former slave still alive in the late 30s who contributed amongst, amongst many other sl former slaves to that book, which was a kind of a major deal. So, and those interviews are actually uh, available online now, and I'll show you the website for that in a minute. But meanwhile, the war effort is ramping up, and this guy is popping up a lot. Does anyone recognize this guy? Congressman? Yes, yeah, well done. Congressman Martin Dyes of Texas, uh, who chaired the... Yeah, House of uh, Un-American Activities Committee. <laughs> and uh, that, that group, so throughout his whole life, whenever, the, and not just the Federal Writers Project, but the Federal Art Project, the Federal Music Project, and the WPA as a whole was always under a barrage of criticism, particularly from the right. And uh, the House of Un-American Activities Committee um, got pretty involved with trying to sort of uh, take down federal funding for the initiatives and under the, under the charge of them being sort of a communist plot, right, of, of these, these projects harboring communists in all these different towns around the country, which isn't entirely untrue. <laughs> a lot of the writers for the Federal Writers Project were very left-wing in their sympathies, and that does actually come out sometimes in the books. Uh, the books have a very strong... Um, well, as strong as you could be when you're being edited for a nationally published book, but like, there, you can see it, at least in the margins, the sort of support for left-wing causes, so sort of uh, unionized labor, for example, um, is, is never really dealt with in a critical fashion in the books. Yeah? Well, yeah, but HUAC was initially formed for, among other reasons, to search out and ferret out Nazis right. in this country, and they swayed over to, to go after the left. He was a Democrat. And they swayed over to go after the left when I when they found out that some of their friends, like Charles Lindbergh and Henry Ford and other big people in the U.S., were not fond of them going after their friends who were Nazis. Uh, right. That's a great little background too on it, but. Um, that, I mean, there's a few factors that go into it, but ultimately, in, in the end, federal sponsorship is discontinued for the project. However, the states were allowed to continue sponsoring what used to be called the Federal Writers Project as state-sponsored initiatives for as long as they wanted to, or as long as they had funds, which in reality just translated through the, about the middle part of the 1940s before the Federal Writers Project was completely done. So here's a little kind of a funny uh, photograph that's after the, after the federal government funds were completed and, and no longer available. Um, some of the people involved in the New York Federal Writers Project staged a mock funeral for the Federal Writers Project, which you see a photograph of here. Stop WPA cuts. You know, that's the coffin for the Federal Writers Project. So the program continued to bid under state sponsorship until 1943, and then it basically uh, was gone. It basically had ceased to exist at that point. However, the the and not, so not only did you know, the writers that were involved in the Federal Writers Project produce a huge amount of uh, classic 20th century American literature, but it also became a hugely influential series for later travel writers or people that were, went on to sort of examine the American spirit in the 20th century. So the American Guide series comes up in some of these books here, some of which you might have read or have heard of. Uh, Travels with Charlie is the most famous example of that. Toward the end of Steinbeck's life, he drove around the country in 1960 in a, with with a poodle, with Charlie here. Yep, exactly. One of my favorite books, actually, of all time. I really love that book. And, uh, and he said in the book, if there had been room in his, in his truck, he would have packed every WPA guide, all 48 of them. I have all of them, and some are very rare. The complete set comprises the most comprehensive account of the United, the United States ever got together, and nothing since it has ever approached it. It was compiled during the Depression by the best writers in America who were, if that is possible, more depressed than any other group while maintaining <laughs> their inalienable instinct for eating. So that's a quote from Travels with Charlie where um, he brings along some of the books, and as he said, he, he wished he could have brought all of them with. And then uh, Blue Highways, has, has anyone read Blue Highways? Yep. So that one was also uh, strongly influenced. William Lee Seatmoon brought along American Guide series books when he was on that journey. And I don't know if anyone's read Inside USA. That was, uh, see at least one nod in the back there. That was a big bestseller though in the late 40s. So this was kind of probably the first book that kind of mined the American Guide series for their cultural history. And uh, John Gunther brought along a bunch of the WPA guides as he traveled around the country and produced that book. And then even into today, the books get referenced every now and then. Uh, Michael Chabon, when he was writing 
the Pulitzer Prize winner, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, which takes place in New York around that same time, uh, heavily mined the New York City entries in the American Guide series and talked a lot about that in, in his, on his publicity stunts for that book. And uh, this is a little more recent book that came out that was a bestseller. That was, it's called State by State, A Panoramic Portrait of America, 50 Writers on 50 States. A couple of editors just thought this, this project was really cool, you know, this American Guide series project, and wanted to duplicate it in some way. And what they came up with, since it'd be virtually impossible to duplicate the American Guide series, it's involved a huge amount of people across the entire nation. So what they came up with instead was uh, 50 essays by authors in different states, right? So um, for Tennessee, for example, they got Ann Patchett to write an essay about Tennessee and famous authors from a variety of other states contributed too. And that's, we own both of these books here at Deschutes Public Library as well, in case you were interested. And then also in the early 2000s, there's been a pretty significant, low key, but significant effort from the Library of Congress to digitize a lot of this stuff and make, make a lot of these uh, interviews and oral histories that were conducted by the Federal Writers Project, but that were not published in that era available freely online, and, and a lot of them are available if anyone, and the website's a little bit awkward to tell you, but if you Google Federal Writers Project and look for about the second or third result, it'll be really close to the top of your page. There'll be an entry from the Library of Congress, which you'll know because it'll say, you know, loc.gov. If you click on that, it takes you to this page, and there's a variety of material online. You can read collections, you can listen to oral history interviews that were produced by the project and so on. And that's kind of the, the, the current state of it. So uh, the only other things I was going to pass around was this, this is the Washington DC guide. We didn't talk about the drama or anything behind this guide, but I wanted to show you guys this because um, it's not really much of a guidebook, right? I mean, this thing's huge. And this is the, this is the criticism that some people used to raise about the American Guide series is that are you really going to haul this thing around with you while you're touring Washington DC? So that's the, that was what was hoped to have been the first volume in the series, but wasn't. It's like six pounds or something. It's the largest one. Right. And it's about sort of the smallest geographic area in a way, which is also kind of interesting. But this is before paperbacks, weirdly. You know, like paperbacks weren't really much of a thing until the post-World War II era. Well, wartime. Yeah. Especially pocketbooks for soldiers. You're right. Yeah, but they, they kind of took off, like, as we're heading into the 50s. And so none of the American Guide series were produced in paperback format originally. Although there's recent reprints, if, if anyone ever wants to buy books in that series. One from 1980. Perfect. In paperback. <laughs> yeah, still, still heavy. But they, they've been reprinting a lot of the guides and putting introductory essays to them, which is nice to kind of, you know, to show you how things have changed or who contributed to that project. And um, we actually have, I was surprised we had this. I was looking around in our books here at the library. This is owned by us and available for checkout if anyone wants it. This is the Oregon entry in the American Guide series, which Amazingly, we haven't weeded. <laughs> so, um, if anyone wants to check it out, uh, that's that's it there. And um, the books that you're looking at are from my personal collection. There's a few more of them on display upstairs. If you're curious, at the by the adult reference desk, and then a, a lot more of them I don't I didn't bring into the library. But that's that wraps up my talk.